Well hello internet and welcome to part three of my electronics video tutorial. In this part of the tutorial I'm going to take a look at capacitors, diodes, variable resistors, schematic diagrams, electronic circuit diagramming software, and a whole lot more. If you haven't watched the previous parts of this tutorial you probably should otherwise you might be confused and there's links to those in the description as well as links to all the schematic drawings that I make in this tutorial and I have a lot to do so let's get into it. And in the previous parts of the tutorial, of course, we took a look at Ohm's Law, which is extremely important, and how I like to remember how to calculate voltage with current and resistance is that the player that played with voltage went to the IR, so just remember to multiply I times R to get voltage. And then to get current as well as resistance, you're going to be dividing into voltage with the remaining character, be it either resistance or current. Okay, so now I'm going to measure voltage drop in a circuit by analyzing resistors in series, and I'm going to have a 470 ohm resistor and a 1000 ohm resistor. And the first thing I'm going to do is measure current by pulling up one of those terminals. It comes out to just about 4.3, and then I'm going to unplug or turn off my battery, and I'm going to measure resistance across the first resistor, come out to 0.465, and then if I measure voltage drop, that comes right out to be about 2. And now I'm going to use a nifty formula to verify what I got there with my multimeter. You can see that I plugged in for current 4.26, and that's milliamps, and we're going to multiply that times 0.465 kiloohms, and we come out to a result of 1.98 volts, which is pretty much exactly on spot. And as you can see here, we have another formula that would allow us to measure voltage drop in either one of those two resistors. And that brings us to capacitors. Now a capacitor is going to store electrons even after the power supply is disconnected. And a capacitor is going to contain two metal plates that are going to be separated by an insulator or a dielectric. And while a battery produces charged particles through an electrochemical reaction, a capacitor instead is going to allow charged particles to build up on the metal plates it contains. Now as you're going to see, electrons are going to flow into a capacitor and eventually reach a point in which they have no place to go. And then at that point, they're going to block the conductive path. And then what's going to happen is the other plate in the capacitor is going to have what we call a net positive charge. Transfer then is going to stop whenever the voltage of the capacitor is equal to the battery voltage. Now there are five main capacitor symbols. The curved line is going to represent the more negative side and sometimes you'll also see a plus sign and in that situation it is going to be facing towards the most positive part of the charge and also if you see an arrow going through the capacitor symbol that means it's a variable capacitor. Now capacitance is going to describe how much charge a capacitor can store and the higher the capacitance the more charge it can be stored. So a capacitance is normally measured in farads, where one farad is going to equal the capacitance needed to get one amp to flow. And because a farad is considered too large for most situations, and so here what I did was just list some of the more common capacitance measurement units you're more than likely to see. The highest voltage recommended for capacitors designed for DC circuits like we're going to be using is somewhere between 16 to 35 volts, but of course you should check with the manufacturer. And on this screen I list most of the small capacitors you're going to be seeing and the three digit system that they use and the unit of measure that they match up with. Many capacitors also have a letter code that's going to indicate how far off the capacitance may be or the tolerance, whatever you want to call it, and you can see all of those letter codes right here. Now I'll demonstrate in a real circuit exactly how a capacitor works with some LEDs. I'm going to start with a 9 volt battery and connect that to my breadboard and then I'm going to get a jumper wire and throw that in there and then I'm going to get an SPDT switch or a single pole double throw switch and throw that inside of there and connect a 2.2 kilo ohm resistor. Now I can add in another jumper wire over on the other side of my switch and then I'm going to get myself a 470 microfarad capacitor and the short end of the negative lead is going to go towards the negative part of our battery and the, or you could think of it the other way, the longer end goes towards the more positive end. Throw another jumper wire inside of there and then I'm going to get an LED and I'm going to connect the long end pointing towards the positive part of our breadboard and then I'm going to get another LED and this one I'm going to plug it in in exactly the same port and I'm going to have this time put it in the opposite direction. 
So what exactly is happening? Well basically whenever the switch is down that's going to charge our capacitor and as it charges current is going to flow to the LED until the voltage of the capacitor equals the voltage of the battery. Then the LED is going to reach a point in which it doesn't receive a charge which it's going to dim and then the second LED is not going to light up because its lead is backwards. Then, whenever the switch is up, the electrons flow into the opposite direction, out of the capacitor into the resistor, and lights up the LED until the charge is used up. And now I'm going to show you exactly how this works in a different way using electronic circuit diagramming software. Now I thought I'd use a piece of software called iCircuit to explain exactly what's going on here because I think it might work a little bit better. You can see right here we have our battery, here we have our switch, here we have our resistor, here we have our capacitor, and here we have our two LEDs. And currently if we want to set it up, what we're going to do is we're going to switch down to charge our capacitor. So I'm going to come over here and say closed. And now you can see real briefly there that the capacitor was charged. And that's being represented here by having this be green. And you could also see there real briefly, let me just switch it back off and then back on again. You're going to see the LED lights up down here and then it stops lighting up. And the reason why is it stops lighting up just simply because it stopped receiving a charge and then it dims. And of course the second LED doesn't light up because its lead is backwards, so there's no way to light it up. But you can also see here the capacitor is now charged and now if I want to power the other LED, all I need to do is switch this from closed and you could see there that LED went and charged. And we could switch that back and forth. And quite simply, when the switch is up, the electrons are going to flow in the opposite direction out of the capacitor into the resistor and then light up the LED until the charge is all used up. So I thought that would be a nice representation here to see the circuit in multiple different ways. Now something that's interesting is that the resistor you use is actually going to define how long it takes to charge and discharge your capacitor. Now it's going to take approximately five times the resistance in ohms times the capacitance in farads. So we're going to convert our normal 470 micro ohms to 0 .0047 farads. And that's going to come out to 1.03 seconds, and if we multiply that times 5, that's 5 seconds roughly. And you can see if we switch this, one, whoops, let's go and switch it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you can see it pretty much predicts exactly how long it's going to take for that capacitor to discharge as well as to charge. Now we're going to take a look at the sum of capacitors in parallel and you can see right there we have a 104 on there which is equivalent to 0.1 microfarads and we're going to measure this using our multimeter and we'll just insert them and that's how we would insert them if we want them in parallel. And you can see that they measure out to be around right around 96.3 nanofarads whenever we measure those. And then you'll see that they actually sum versus the opposite with resistors and it's going to come out to right around 192.6 or 193 on the multimeter. Now if we measure the capacitors in series you're going to see that the capacitance is actually reduced. Once again the capacitance is going to be 96.3 nanofarads and if we measure them in series it's going to come out to approximately 47.6 nanofarads. And you can see the formula there on your screen to calculate this out if you wanted to verify what you see on your multimeter. Now as we saw in a previous part of this tutorial, a diode is a simple semiconductor device and what sets it apart is it only conducts a charge in one direction. Now diodes can convert alternating current to a pulsing direct current. It can also be used to convert a radio signal into a charge you can hear through a speaker and this is called rectification which we'll get into later. And a diode is going to contain an anode and a cathode and the schematic symbol for a diode should look familiar because an LED, which we have already covered, is also a diode. And the schematic symbol for a diode has an arrow which represents the anode and a straight vertical line which represents the cathode and current is going to flow from the anode to the cathode. And on a real diode, a white or black band is going to identify the cathode terminal on that diode. And that band is going to identify the terminal in which a positive charge, again, we're going to be using conventional current here when we're describing this. And it's going to show where the positive charge is going to flow out whenever the diode is conducting a charge. And like we covered in the first tutorial, an LED is going to contain two semiconductors. The N-type has more electrons, while the P-type has holes where electrons used to be. And whenever a charge is a Applied, the electrons are going to move from the n-type to the p-type and of course electrons won't flow in the opposite direction and whenever you have a conventional current we say that current flows from the anode to the cathode. 
And that will prove that is exactly how a die hood works. We're going to throw in a jumper wire and then I'm going to throw in a switch, an SPDT again, once again, and then I'm going to get myself a silicone diode and you can see where the line is on the diode, how it connects to our breadboard. And then I'll add in a 100 ohm resistor. And then I'll add in another diode, which is our red LED. And this is a three volt battery pack. And you can see there it works. However, if we come in and get our diode and pull it out and insert it in the opposite direction, if we hit our switch, it will not light. And once again, just wanted to show you a circuit diagram in here using iCircuit, where this isn't a sponsored piece of software. It's just a real cheap piece of software that works pretty well. It costs about five bucks. You can use it anywhere. You can see here, is the diode representation. There's no arrows, so you know that it's not an LED. Then we have our resistor, we have our LED, and then we have our battery once again. And you can see here real easily that whenever I open or close that circuit that it is going to flow. And I could come in here and delete this diode altogether and then come in and throw in another diode and flip it around. And of course you're going to see, well, let's go and grab it like this. And if I switch the diode in the opposite direction, you're going to see that it is not going to be able to flow through there. So let's just jump back over here and end. you can see that it's not loading. Okay, so just a representation schematically so that you get more comfortable with schematic diagrams and can better understand them. And in the next example, I'm going to show you some other things about diodes as well as variable resistors. And the purpose of that is, is to explain that each diode has a minimum turn-on voltage known as its forward voltage. And a silicone diode is going to require a voltage of around 0.6 volts, while an LED is going to require anywhere from 1.5 to 4.7 volts. And if a diode doesn't receive enough voltage, it is said to be unbiased. And the peak reverse voltage is the voltage at which the diode would actually break down if the current flows in the wrong direction. And now I'm going to show you a project in which we're going to demonstrate both forward voltage as well as a variable resistor. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to throw in a 470 ohm resistor, and this is a potentiometer, it's a variable resistor, and then we're going to connect our jumper wires, and there's going to be three pins on the potentiometer, and we're going to put those jumper wires in there. And specifically, it's a 10 kilo ohm variable resistor, and what makes it different from a regular resistor is it can change its resistance, and it can be used as either a two or three terminal component, where the center terminal is going to be connected to a wiper that is going to increase or decrease our resistance. And if only two terminals are going to be used, it's going to act as a variable resistor or a rheostat. And if all three are going to be used, it is a potentiometer that's going to form a voltage divider. Now, a voltage divider is going to act just like two resistors connected in a series like we saw in the previous tutorial. And as we increase the resistance between two terminals, we are going to decrease the resistance between the other two. And by setting up the potentiometer so that we have a terminal on either side of the LED, we can set the resistance of the LED. And since the LED requires a voltage of 1.5 volts to turn on, whenever we set the resistance of the variable resistor below that, we can also turn it off, as you can see right here. And here I thought it would be good to take a look at iCircuit once again so that we can better understand our variable resistor or potentiometer. And basically what I'm going to do here is, here I previously I showed you just one LED, I wanted to show you two LEDs so you can see exactly how the potentiometer actually works. And what I'm going to do over here is just change the position of our variable resistor and you're going to see how that is going to affect our LEDs. If we place another LED between the other terminal rather than just using one LED, we're going to be able to switch back and forth between which LED is going to light up. And we're going to be able to do this just by increasing one resistance as we decrease the other resistance. And there you go guys, that is part three of my electronics tutorial. Don't worry if you didn't catch everything, I will be reviewing it and creating big projects to explain everything further. And before I leave, just wanted to thank all my supporters over on Patreon. I'm able to make videos like this because of you guys, so thank you very much. And just like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.